as we dive in over these three days to look at the vision of God for building churches. What is he doing on the earth? What has he been doing for the last 2000 years? And, and not just not just looking at the stuff that's happening, but his vision, his purpose, what he understands is the church, what he wants the church to be. Not just what we've been trying to do, but what truly is his vision, what truly is a healthy church. And we recognize that there is a huge amount of work being done around the world in churches. Many, many ministries, many, many churches. Uh, it's estimated that there are five, a total of five million Christian leaders around the world uh, today. That does not include, you know, small group leaders and prayer meeting leaders and, and uh, those kind of leaders. This is just more pastors and priests and uh, the uh, official uh, organizational leaders. Five million who are doing an extraordinary amount of work every day. A uh, so vast number of churches all over the world doing uh, an, an extraordinary amount of work. Um, but we need to understand what is God's vision for the church, what he wants the church to be and to do, so, or else we might end up at the end of our lives, having done, having poured our lives into ministries and programs and things, but yet we missed the core reality of what God wanted to do in the church. And so we're going to dig quite deeply into his vision. So look on page nine, please. And you see in the middle of the page there, the two passages. And here in Matthew 28, a scripture we all know very, very well. Go and make disciples in all nations, baptizing them, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded uh, you. This is the commandment of the Lord Jesus. He gives us very clear instructions. What were his instructions? Go and do what? Make disciples. And he was, not, he was not just referring to disciple a new believer. Of course, it includes that, but it's much bigger than that, wasn't it? Because he says, teaching them to observe everything that I've commanded you. So, this is, so discipling does not just refer to the basics of the Christian faith. Of course, it includes that, but it's much bigger. He said, go and make disciples. Go and build people's lives. Amen. Wow. That was the Great Commission. Do this all over the world, every nation, every people group. <laughs> build people. And then the second passage here in Matthew 16, beautiful vision, purpose, revelation of his purpose. I will build my church. We look at the nations. The nations are raging, aren't they, today? All the hubbub and the conflict. One nation rises, another nation falls, and so much going on in the earth. And yet, in the middle of it all, He is building His church. Amen. God, the God who created the heavens, the God who right now is keeping the planets in their orbits around the sun. This is the core thing that he's doing. The thing that counts to him. I will build my church. Wow. And so let's come apart from all of the distractions and the pressures and the, the turmoil and the challenges and all the noise. And in these three days, we're going to focus deeply on this vision of God to build his church. And uh, here's a leadership idea. Think about a football match or soccer match, a football match. And there are two places where the action happens where things happen. Firstly, is on the field, yeah? The teams playing, kicking the ball, tripping each other, you know, whacking each other, all the stuff that they do these days. 
But then there's also another place, very important place, up in the stands where the people sit and watch those who are playing the game, right? So think about leadership this way, that there are two places for leaders to stand. On the one hand, it's on the field, in the game, doing the work, in the, the messiness, the complexity, the action, right? Of leadership, the daily complexity of leadership. But there's also another place where the leader must stand, and that is up in the stands, looking down at the action on the field, yeah? Which of these two places is most important for the leader to stand? Which one? Huh? Very good. <laughs> both. Amen. The leader must stand in both. And actually, we must stand in both like continuously or, you know, practically we go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. We've got to constantly get up in the stands out of the action and look down on the action so that we can make sense of it. Now, what's the benefit for, of the leader being on the field? What's the benefit practically of that for the leader? Experience. Experience. He's involved. He's, invo he's at ground zero, right in the middle of it. He's there with the team, yeah? He has credibility. He, he's, he's not just somebody in an ivory tower. He's got his hands on the work. Yeah? He knows the pressure. Yeah, wow. He knows what he's talking about when he's on the field, in the action. This is where we live. This is where things get done. Yeah? Nothing gets done up on the stands. It's when you're on the field. Your hands are on the work, right? But what are the advantages of being up in the stands? We can encourage, we shout, we cheer. What else? We can see the whole picture. We can see where the mistakes are happening. Wow. We've got a very different perspective, isn't it? When you're on the field, all you see is you know, a few meters, you know, I mean, maybe a lot, but I mean, you're, you're, you're just right there. It's, it's the immediate action that you're, and, and it's what I need to do now, and then I need to do this, and then I need, and you're all consumed in the moment, right, of the action. But when you're up in the stands, you have a completely different perspective. You look down on the whole thing, you see where the whole thing is moving, you see the errors, you see the, uh, the victories, uh, you see the strategy as a whole, is it working or not working? Very hard to see that when you're in the middle of the action. All you're trying to do is get around this next guy or, you know, stop him from uh, knocking you over. So we must stand in both. As a leader, you must stand in both positions, essentially, continuously. Does that make sense? So what we're going to do in a very special way over these three days is we're going to get up in the stands. That's the nature of this work. We're going to look at the big picture of God's purpose and vision for the church. We're going to reflect very deeply on our own churches, on the churches in our own nations. How are we doing? What is the level of health? Do we even know what we're doing in our churches? You know, so often, I mean, I've, I've had the privilege of working with many thousands of leaders all over the world for 30 years now. And uh, I, I sadly, I, I see consistently so many uh, Christian leaders, church leaders, just simply keep doing the same things because that's what they've always done. They, they don't necessarily have a clear picture of what it is we're doing. Why are we doing this? How does this fit with the great eternal purposes of God? And I don't say that critically. I, I understand. I'm a church leader myself. Uh, 26 years of uh, frontline pastoral uh, experience. I've been uh, planting churches, leading churches. I, I, I understand the complexity, the difficulty, the challenges of that. 
um, the constant crises that church leaders face, yeah? Uh, the constant pressures. It's really hard to be a church leader. I get that. Uh, but the downside, uh, and, and I really appreciate the labor and the sacrifice, the labor of love that church leaders give. But the downside is that we lose perspective. We become just overwhelmed by the complexities, the pressures, the problems, you know, the disasters, the, you know, the opportunities, and we lose the perspective. And we end up just day after day, just we just keep doing the same things, trying to put the fires out, stop the problems, uh, you know, grow the church, but we lose perspective. So this is a very special time that we have in these three days to be solidly up in the stands, reconnecting with what God says about His purposes for His church in the nations. Reconnecting and reflecting very deeply upon our own churches in our own nations. Does that make sense? So that's the meaning and the nature of this course. Let's go now to the first big section, page 14 in the manual. And we're going to dig into God's vision for the church. Before we start worrying about what's your attendance on Sunday <laughs> and what's the quality of your children's ministry, do you understand? On the field, we're going to get way up high in the stands and look at things from <laughs> God's eternal perspective. What's his vision for the church? And let's read together Matthew 16, 13 and 19. Let's read this out loud together. Now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the son of man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. These... Amen. That's, that's it. Don't, don't add to the scripture. There, that'll get you in serious trouble really quick. <laughs> so here, in these uh, five words, we see the revelation of the central purpose of God on the earth for the ages. Let's look at the context in which Jesus says these words. So he asks... This profound question, who do you say that I am? Who do people say? Who do you say that I am? And think about the nature of this question. He's not asking them, uh, what's my name? You know, or what city was I born? Or where do I live? But he was going deeply into who he is. Eternal God, infinite God, the Christ, the Messiah the Son of the living God, the Redeemer of mankind, the King of the nations, yeah? The purpose of God, the one who perfectly, fully revealed the Father. Do you understand? He's asking, essentially, how do you understand me? What do you see is the meaning of me, my person, my life, my mission, yeah? It's a really big question. And Peter's response then to this profound question, he goes, a beautiful revelation. You're the Christ, the son of the living God. 
And hit, the question was huge. The answer was huge. So Jesus, uh, uh, Peter didn't simply say, well, your name is Jesus, of course, or you're from Nazareth and you're working in Galilee right now or, or wherever he is in uh, Caesarea. Um, but instead, he goes to the big perspective. You're the Messiah. You are the one who has come to reveal God. You are the one about whom the prophets spoke in the Old Testament and said that you would come and redeem the nations. Yeah, really big answer. Do you see how big this exchange is? And then Jesus response to Peter equally big. You are blessed. You have heard from God. You have had insight. It's, and it's not just your brilliance. It's not that you studied the Old Testament and then studied my life and did some research and came up with a, you know, some nice theory about something or other. You've heard from the Father. The Father has spoken to you. He's opened your heart. He's opened your eyes and you see me for who I am. Wow. This profound revelation of the person the nature, the vision, the mission, the eternal mission of the Lord Jesus. And then he says, on this rock, I will build my church. Amen. The revelation of the person, the big revelation of the nature of the Lord Jesus, his person, his work, his mission. On this reality, I will build my church. So do you see how big the church is in the eyes of God, in the purposes of God? This is the core thing that God is doing on the earth. And of course, there are lots of things that God is doing on the earth. Raises up one nation, puts down another you know, keeps the planets going around in their orbit. I mean, there's, there's an awful lot that God is doing. He holds all things together by the word of his power. Yes, I mean, God's, you know, he's doing an ama you know, inf almost infinite number of things. <laughs> but in the middle of it all, this is the preeminent thing that God is doing on the earth. And when we see this, it gives us a clear passion and a vision. And it raises the criticalness of us getting this right. This is the thing that he's doing. So we need to understand what is it? What is his church? What is a healthy church? How is he building this church? Do you see? See, it's not that building his church is one of 10 great things that God is doing. And he's doing many great things. He's doing way more than 10. But it's not that building his church is just one of them all at the same level. This is the preeminent purpose of God upon the earth around which everything else revolves. Uh, someone says, well, but I thought Jesus came to the earth to seek and to save the lost. Absolutely he did. In order that they would then be a part of this beautiful bride. Yeah. Do you understand? So think of the church at this absolute level of preeminence in the purposes of God. And that will give us a huge motivation uh, to properly understand the church and to give our lives for serving the church in the way that God intended, yeah? And what a privilege that we have that He's called us to work with Him in this extraordinary work, yeah? The preeminent purpose of God on the earth, the building of His church, and He's called you to work with Him, to be a part of that, that raising up of the beautiful bride. Is that cool? Yes. 
And dear friends, this is why we must stay focused. We've, he, we've got this calling from God and we dare not allow ourselves to be distracted. Sadly, uh, in many churches, especially in the Western church these days, we see other agendas, other visions coming in. Uh, we see, for example, uh, political agendas and political visions uh, entering the church. And then people thinking, well, what God wants to do is he wants to restore righteousness. You know, he wants to bring righteousness to politics or, 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 or something like that. And, and then, but if we see, if, if we understand that God's biggest thing that he wants to do on the earth is political, what are we going to give our focus to? Politics. And if we do that, you know what happens to our life? It just shrivels and withers. We get involved in human political efforts instead of doing what Jesus told us to do. By the way, what was it he told us to do? The last thing he said? Go and make disciples. Yeah. Go and build people's lives. Wow. In the building of his church. Does that make sense? So let's embrace a very clear vision here for the preeminence of the vision of God for building his bride in the nations and understand everything that Jesus did in this context. So, for example, we know we need to build leaders. Amen. That was a major uh, purpose of the Lord Jesus during his three years on the earth. Absolutely critical. We know in the church around the world we face a crisis. A leadership crisis not enough leaders not enough quality in the leaders yeah we know this but building leaders is not the end we don't build leaders just so we can have leaders we build leaders in order that what so that they can then build and lead the church healthy church yeah so building leaders as core and as absolutely central as it must be for our lives and work it's a means to an end. The end is the raising up of the church. We want to build healthy leaders in order that they will build and lead healthy churches. Does that make sense? Uh, and so Jesus invested his three years in building leaders in order that they would then build, establish his bride upon the earth uh, and raise it up well. Let's look, please, on page 16, and let's look at this passage here in Ephesians 3, 8 to 11. To me, though I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things but is now revealed in order that through the church, the beautiful bride, the manifold, the many sided wisdom of God, the glory of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. And this was according to the eternal purpose that he has now realized in Christ Jesus, our Lord the eternal purpose of God to establish on the earth this precious, beautiful bride made up not only of the Jew, but now also of the Gentile. You know, that's the mystery, the specific mystery he's referring to here in Ephesians 2 and 3. Together in this beautiful bride to reveal God's glory. Amen. Wow. So let's turn in your Bibles, please, to uh, Ephesians 3, the passage that we just read. And let's everyone stand, please. Open your Bibles to Ephesians 3 and let's everyone please stand. And look at this passage. We just read Ephesians 3, 8 to 11. This beautiful revelation of the eternal purpose of God. Now let's go to verse 14, where he says, For this reason, 
in view of this magnificent, eternal purpose of God in His church, therefore, I kneel before the Father and I pray. And He gives this spectacular prayer from verses 16 to 19. So everyone, please get in pairs and then one by one, pairs or three at the most, and one by one, please pray this prayer for your partner. Put their name in here. Pray it directly, personally for them. The prayer in Ephesians 3, verses 16 to 19. Let's do that now, please. Let's pray this intensely, one for another. Amen. Let's come together again, please. Let's uh, please be seated. Isn't that just a spectacular statement right at the end of that prayer? That you might be filled to the measure of the fullness of God. What? The fullness of God. How, how big is God? What's the number? Like really, really, really big, yeah? Infinite. And here, his purpose, his vision, Paul's prayer that would be filled with his fullness. Look, think back to the beginning when God created man. Why did God make man? What was God's purpose in making man? What was it? Yeah, that, God, that man would fellowship with God. That there would be union, that there would be intimate fellowship between God and man. That's why God made man in his own image. Amen. So that man could know God, experience God, love God, walk with God, experience him, experience his fullness. And of course, man went his own way. Sin came between man and God. And the Lord Jesus came to take away the barrier of sin, to tear the curtain from top to bottom, yeah? So that we are now again welcomed into the very deepest place in God, the fullness of His presence. So we once again can know Him, love Him, experience Him, be united with Him, yeah? Remember eternity. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, what were they doing? Fellowship. They were looking at each other, loving one another, giving themselves to each other. This beautiful, <laughs> eternal celebration of love and life and fellowship within the Godhead. And then God made man to welcome him into that fellowship. That was the meaning of creation of man Amen. in the first place. And that is the meaning of the redemption of man. Jesus didn't just redeem us to set us free from hell. Thank God for that. That's a part of it, of course. Wow, we're eternally grateful. But more than that, bigger, better than that, He redeemed us so that we could again know Him, so that we could again experience Him, love Him. Wow. And Jesus defines eternal life in John 17, 3. What is eternal life? Whoa, that we may know Him. Union of life. But not just individual union of life. Corporate union of life. You see here Paul's prayer in Ephesians 3. He's not just praying for us individually, but He wants us. See, notice in verse 18, have power with all the saints. Yeah? With all the Lord's people. This is the bride of Christ that we together would experience God in His fullness. Do you understand? See, this is the building of the church. It's not just God wants us to build that church. All right, we better go build a building. Or God wants us to build the church. Okay, we would better go start a few programs on this and that. You know, start a Sunday morning meeting with, you know, a light show and a smoke machine and... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> to build the church means to work co-workers with God in the raising up of this body, this beautiful body that together, corporately, we experience the fullness of the love and the height and the depth and the breadth of His love that we together would be filled with all the fullness of God. That's 
his vision. Not a small thing, dear friends. And it's not just one of many purposes of God. This is the highest thing that he's doing on the earth. He's bringing a people into the experience of eternal union with himself. Oh, that's what we're doing as church leaders. We're not running programs, dear brother, dear sister. We're not trying to increase the numbers on Sunday morning, get more attendance. We're not trying to, you know, just meet the budget. You know, all the things that everybody is, you know, so preoccupied with. Let's lift up our eyes. Let's get out of the struggle and the, you know, the chaos of the battle, you know, on the field. Let's get up in the stands and see the vision of God. A people who know Him. A people who together are filled with His fullness. That's what Jesus said He would build. That's why He redeemed us. That's why He's building leaders. In order to build this beautiful bride. Do you understand? This is His vision. <laughs> Praise God. All right, let's go please to page uh, 17. Page 17, Jesus' words, I will build my church. And in this statement, we see three key ideas. Firstly, he's building his church. He's not just throwing it together. He's not just hoping that somehow something good is going to come out of this. He has a very clear design. He knows exactly what it is he wants to build. And he knows exactly how it is that it needs to be built. Do you understand? He doesn't just say, all right, I want to build my church. So off you go. Do whatever you think might be a good idea uh, to do whatever it is that you may want to do and call it church. Yeah. We need to settle this, dear friends, because a lot of what we do in church leadership is exactly what I just described. We define our own church. And then we define our own design for what we're going to do in building that church. Ugh. We need to come back to the scriptures. Look at this very deeply, very clearly. What is actually his purpose? Because he tells us, as we're going to see over these three days, he tells us crystal clear what his vision is and what his design is to achieve that vision. He does tell us. It's fantastic. But that's it. That's your only option. Our only option is to return to his design, his purpose, his vision, his strategy. Do you agree with me? Amen. Secondly, we see that it is Jesus who is building his church. Thank God. Ultimately, it's not us. <laughs> wow. It's his. Isn't that who? <laughs> I mean, what if he said, all right, all right, Andy, here, here your responsibility is to raise up this um, corporate people of God in Brunei and they're going to uh, experience the fullness of God. That'd be the end of the world. <laughs> That'd be the end of Brunei. <laughs> and, you know, and, and it's up to you to sort of figure out how to do that. And, and, and it's all dependent upon your strength and your wisdom. And oh, dear. We would just collapse, wouldn't we? We have no idea. Thank God it's his work. But he invites us to co-work with him. And so in that sense, we can say that we are building it, although it is simply uniting with him in his vision and in his work. But he's the one doing it. It's his purpose. Um, it's his work, his vision. Thank God. And so we recognize that apart from him, we cannot do it. Amen. But as we abide in him and he in us, we will bear fruit. And astonishingly, his church will be built. Because he said he will build it. You know, we look at the church in our nations and we think, wow, how are we ever... You know, don't we? How are we ever going to hit God's high mark? 
And yet he will. He is doing it. He's so wise. He's so far beyond our ability, our wisdom, our strength. You know, yeah, he will do it. Thank God. And then the third insight here is that building the church takes time. It's not a quick fix. Um, sadly, so many of us as church leaders around the world, we're always looking for the latest thing, aren't we? You know, what's the latest strat you know, church growth strategy or this strategy? You know, and we hear about some other church. They, they did this kind of program and, you know, here's what happened. So let's go. Let's learn from them. Let's copy their thing. And, we, you know, we try to copy this, copy that. And, you know, we, we finally master this and something new comes along. And so we chuck that and we, you know, <laughs> this is what we do as church leaders. Um, instead, and, and, and part of it is that we're looking for um, just the simple thing. If we just do this, then it'll then it'll work. Um, and, 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 and we must embrace the reality that building the church is really hard. It's hard. It's hard work. And it takes a lifetime. It's not something that if we can just figure out the right structure or the right mix of programs, then suddenly we will have the healthy church. Give up on that. This will take us all of our lives as we move toward the vision of God day by day, step by step. Is that okay? That's the reality, dear friends. Let's face that reality. Good. So let's get in our teams now. Let's reflect on our churches. Let's reflect on what has been our own experience, what has been our own vision, our own practice in church life. Has it been big enough? Or have we gotten too bogged down in the details? Of running this program, meeting that budget. Do you understand? <coughs> and have we lost sight of the glorious, grand vision of God? You know, when we get bogged down in the programs and the details, it just wears us out, doesn't it? We get frustrated with the church. Sometimes we can even get angry with the church. Yeah? Yeah? have a negative attitude toward the church. So many leaders do. <coughs> let's ask God. Let's pray together in our teams. Let's stand together, please. And let's ask God to bring us, at least for these days, out of the details, the pressures, the struggles, the strivings. Lift up our vision. Embrace His full, beautiful eternal vision. Let's pray together now in our teams, please. Let's please come together. Let's please come together and be seated, please. What are your thoughts on this? What are, what are your thoughts? Please share your, your thoughts on what we've looked at so far this morning. Please, everyone be seated. Thank you. What are your thoughts? Thanks, Jim. Mary? Um, two thoughts. Uh, first, I want to make a comment, uh, make a uh, connection to what you shared about the leadership, um, the two positions for leader to stand, the, you know, the field and the, the stands. I think what Jesus did with uh, the, the disciples in Matthew 16 is that it, it's just that. Mm. Um, by then, the disciples has been, have been with Jesus for a long time. They've saw enough, they've seen enough, they've seen him teaching, doing miracles, casting out demons, you know, lots of things. And then so, so the day come, Jesus asks, so who am I? Who do you think I wow. am? So this is really calling them from the stand, yeah. from the field to the stand. I'm sure many, many things flash out their mind with that question, who do you think I am? So they would be thinking of, you know, when, he, when Jesus comes to the storm, they themselves ask, who is this? 
who can do such a thing, you know? So I, I'm sure many, many things flashed, you know, throughout our mind. And then they were thinking, you know, and then in that moment, Jesus, uh, Peter heard the Father. Wow, you are Christ. Made sense of everything they've heard, mm. they've seen, they've touched. So I, I think that was a very, you know, the, probably one of the most profound revelation in the whole scripture mm. is mm. that. And then, so Jesus was so excited that <coughs> on this foundation, I will build my church. It's when Peter and the disciples received the, the key revelation of who he is and what he is about. Then it was at that moment Jesus revealed his whole purpose of coming yeah. to wow. the earth. You know, so it wasn't a carol conversation. It was a very profound moment. Mm. Yeah. And uh, so, uh, you know, the cool thing is, it, it's, it's Jesus called them from the stand, to, uh, to the, from the field to the stand. Yeah. And then it was there. And then they were looking at, reflecting on everything they experienced yeah. so far. Yeah. yeah. And then they caught that revelation. Yeah. Yeah. So that was a beautiful thing, you know, just a leadership mm. thing. And also another thought is on these three things here. Um, what does it mean? What does it mean? You know, when Jesus say, "I will build my church." Jesus is building his church. You know, of course, we have pressure, we have persecution. You know, there are many changes. So <coughs> the big goal, the primary goal of, for many churches, is to yeah. achieve existence. We will not diminish. You know, we will not be shut down. We will Just not stay disappear. alive. You yeah. know, we will maintain our presence yeah. in the society. Or you know. You know, so 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 in, for that, you know, toward that goal, you know, then the the process will be, oh, we'll make our training, we'll make our Sunday meeting attractive. Mm. You know, just yeah. whatever we do, just you know, keep existing. That's interesting mm. enough to people, so people will be keep coming. So existing, not building, because building means you have a vision, you have somewhere you are going. And you have strategies you are building the life, but when when your primary goal is achieve existence, <laughs> you just uh, and, 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 and it also means you'll be happy if you are existing. You'll be happy enough. Oh yeah, I <coughs> will achieve. It. Yeah, because we are still existing. So it's not not much beyond Sunday meeting. Um, you know, just for achieving. You know, yeah. The goal because your yep. goal determines your process, your process. And also, Jesus is, big. so the managers don't have a you know, vision or yeah. you know, a goal, a yeah. process. Okay, yeah. and then second, Jesus is building his church, not us. Um, well, managers don't have visions or plans, or you know, uh, there are managers who do have. But then the question is, where does this vision come from? You know, especially with some urban, urban churches, new urban churches, full of ideas full of visions, mm, mm. full of things they want to achieve. Strategies. But, yeah. yeah, strategies. But then the question is, <coughs> is that yours or really Jesus? Because Jesus I will build my church. So that means the, the, the vision, the strategies, the plans has to be his. Mm. So, Amen. you know, when, when, there are, when, there are, when, there, when there are churches fulfilled with those plans, then the question is, where do they come from? Is that yours or Jesus? And also the third thing, building the church takes time. Um, you know, in recent years, uh, feel under great pressure to be really growing in the church. Mm. But I have to ask the question. One time I was talking with so many leaders, I felt so great pressure. Oh, please, let me find a way to grow our church very quickly. But the question, I, I really have to mo question a motive. Why? Why are you so pressured to grow your church? It's because I want to be seen as successful as other mm. churches. Yeah. Yeah. Because they are growing very fast. We are not growing. So I, I really want to know how to grow the church. But not really, you know, to build the church in the way Jesus <laughs> intends to. I just don't want to look back in the midst of other church <laughs> leaders, you know. So, so whatever, you know, can bring a quick result is what I seek. Mm. Not necessarily, you know, building the life of the church in a healthy way for the long term. So looking for quick fix. And that's actually often leads to disaster in the long term. Yeah, burnout too for the leader. Yeah. Yeah. So the third point, building the church takes time. You know, many times we we look for immediate goals. You know, so 
what really attracted me and caught my attention was when we are building a church, there has to be long term visions. Mm, mm, you know, mm. short term visions are good, uh, but at the same time, we need to have we need to have long term visions. And uh, a long th there might be times when we are frustrated. You know, you decide and we are not seeing results, but. We should not be like a child, as we have seen the example here. You know, you, you put the seed under the dirt or under the soil and go and dig out every day and see where is the uh, yeah. result. So, and in IET, in our organization also, we have long term yeah. uh, uh, visions. So, like if you go to a village and if you plant <coughs> a church, then uh, we want to see that in seven to ten years at least uh, the church uh, is uh, uh, healthy uh, church. Wow. Uh, it's a oh. church which is established, it's Amen. a self-supporting church and mm. which is producing daughter churches. Yeah. So you cannot expect from a church to have that in one year or two years. Yeah. You need to have long-term yeah. uh, visions for to see yeah. uh, the fruits uh, being, being born. So yeah. Yeah, I was really uh, touched by that. We need to have mm. long-term mm. uh, long missions. Yeah. Amen. Amen. It's sad, isn't it, that we're... Uh, as church leaders, we're under so much pressure, aren't we, to have something to show for it. And usually that is numbers, isn't it? It's numbers. We just drill it all down to numbers. And, and so then there's pressure to have the numbers. Uh, and so then we do whatever it takes to get the numbers, try to have, you know, entertainment and all this stuff. Not that any of that's bad, but it's just not God's highest purpose. We're just trying to get numbers. Do th you know, and, and then we think, of what's the latest strategy to get more people coming? Brother, yeah. James. The word that I will build my church. I, I need to understand this word, I will build my church. And I know that the key word that I'm, I'm looking at is build. And before you build something, you have to find somewhere to build it, like maybe a foundation. So help me understand here, I will build my church. The building that we talk, Jesus is talking about, where is the foundation? Where is the foundation that he's going to be built in his church? Of I need to know from that foundation. Mm, mm. Amen. Amen. Uh, I, was, I was still profoundly struck by the prayer, the teachings of the faith. Mm. You know, they talk about love. You know? Um, wow. Church should be full of God's love, not full of programs. Wow. You know? uh, yes, we have programs. We, we pray and hope that people feel loved by the program or the master. But bottom line program is program. Right? What's next after this program? But uh, the prayer that uh, we were asked to pray for our partner, you know, the God struck by it, that it is, it is God, it is Christ's love. Church is all about Christ's love. Amen. And can we build that? Can we build that even more so people can feel can can receive it and live it to the full? And yeah. Yeah. Still resonating. Amen. Amen. Well, yeah. Thank you, Andy. And 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 think about that in the context of the nature of God, the eternal nature of God. What is the nature of God? God is love. Love and love is not a feeling or a. But what's the highest? What's the highest form of love? Self-giving. Yeah, giving and self-giving. God so loved the world that he gave his son. And so here within the eternal nature of God, the father loves the son, gives himself to the son. The son of God looking at the father, loving him, gives himself to the father, the Holy Spirit to the father and the son. This incredible giving and receiving of love, self-giving. This fullness of, of this exchange of life and love within the Godhead. This is what he's called us to know corporately. This is the nature of the church. Corporate union with love, infinite self-giving love that we are then looking at God, loving him, giving ourselves to him, receiving the fullness of himself as he gives himself to us and we do it together. And so we then, as Andy just said, loving one another, giving ourselves for one another, that's 
his presence. <laughs> that's his life. That's his purpose. This is what he's building. Oh, my goodness. So it's not just, all right, what are your numbers? How are your numbers? <laughs> and how do your numbers? And, and the next question, of course, we ask them what their numbers are. The next thing we, in our mind is, what are my numbers? Who's got higher numbers? Oh, my. We are like living at this low level, aren't we? God, break us out of that and bring us into the fullness of his vision, his purpose. And if we do that, my goodness, we'll have the numbers. No worries. I mean, God cares. I'm not saying God doesn't care about numbers. Of course he does. That's his people. That's his bride called before the foundation of the world. Yeah. So of course he wants numbers, but he wants it done his way, not man's. Anyone else? I, uh, I notice the uh, passage says, upon this rock will I build my church, to the point that you just asked about. And that rock, of course, some people teach that it's Peter or whatever, but the point is the revelation is the rock. The, the supernatural communication of God's heart <coughs> to Peter was the rock. It goes back to John 17, 3. This is life that you might know. And it's it's not about our strategies. It's not about our plans. It's not about our ideas. It comes back to Jesus' building his church. Amen. So we must really be powerfully energized by real prayer, real connection with God. And I've seen churches trying to establish their mission statement and establish yeah. their purposes and goals. Yeah, and sure. They have meeting after meeting after meeting yep. of strategy yep. and they don't spend two minutes in prayer <laughs> they don't have a team of intercessors that are fasting and mm, praying mm, that mm. our community yeah. of believers will find the purpose of God yeah. and that God will impart the prayer of yep. Ephesians 3 uh, that we will come to know that we'll receive a revelation yeah. I'm telling you if you're trying to build on the foundation of your predecessors, if you're trying to build on the foundation of your organization, and you're not building on this one foundation, knowing Amen. God by yes. revelation. Mm. Amen. Wow. Amen. 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 Yes. Ralph, yeah. Jim behind you, bro. Ralph, thank you. Yeah. Well, I just want to share that in, in, in Cameroon, uh, there's a lot of confusion. Just thinking, um, thinking about that more, the, the third point that I'm talking about, building the church takes time. There's a lot of rush, everybody, not just the number, but also who belongs to who. So you can find a name. Uh, let me take, for example, my name. When I was growing, I was growing in a, in a church with my parents. So in Cameroon right now, you can have an individual that belongs to my church, belongs to his church, belongs to them, because people want identity and their numbers. So there's a lot of confusion, and that is because most of the church leaders don't understand what Jesus yeah. wants them to be doing. Mm. So that confusion makes people to organize programs. So if I have a program, 3,000 came. The 3,000 people who came to my program will be in the other program. So the church is not growing healthy and expanding because of that understanding. So I'm sitting here and I'm asking myself, how many years will it take to build a healthy church? So that we come to the level where we are talking of there are 10,000 people in Cameroon who are Christian. We are talking about 10,000. Not the 10,000, but in actual fact, it's 10 people. Keep moving. So there's a lot of confusion. <laughs> so I'm praying that God will help me uh, in the number of years that we have ahead of us until Jesus comes to rebuild the church. Amen. Do it, Lord. Yeah.